Here we go. Javier Vasquez, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you Javier, for having it is, me. It's an honor to have you. Javier, <clears throat> for our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> I'm a fifth degree now, jujitsu black belt. I'm a former MMA fighter. Um, I fought in the UFC, I fought in the WEC, I fought in Elite XC, I fought in Shudo, I fought in EBI, I fought in ADCC, every basically major promotion that, that was out when I was competing, I fought and won in. I've been doing jiu-jitsu since 1997. I received my black belt in five and a half years. I was a college wrestler uh, coming in to jiu-jitsu. I started fighting in 1998. Had, I've had lots of injuries, lots of ups, lots of downs. And I basically trained my first 10 years of jiu-jitsu under the Carlson Gracie team. And then like following 10 years or so, I, I trained under the Gracie Academy. And uh, so I got a very unique perspective on both mindsets of the jiu-jitsu world. Javier, I'd like to get into your amazing journey through the UFC, MMA. How can someone possibly get a black belt in five and a half years your mindset, how you approach jujitsu. Maybe we could talk about your new JVOS system, how you want to change jujitsu forever. Mm -hmm. Love to speak about your principles. I saw some of your ground and pound instructional. Want to maybe talk mm -hmm. about your principles about being safe on the ground, how the mindsets are different from the Carlson Gracie team, from the Gracie Academy. Uh, but oh, before, wow. yeah. but I understand how you went three rounds once with a torn ACL and you defeated cancer. My goodness. So much to cover here. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go, just one, one thing at a time, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll guide you through it. <laughs> that's, that's dope. Before we do that, Javier, start back all the way from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Well, my family um, immigrated from communist Cuba in 1980. I was four years old. Uh, I always knew that there was something different about my childhood, and it was, it was that I, I grew up in a communist home. <laughs> Not that my family was communist, but they were used to you know, the communist lifestyle. I grew up in California basically my whole life. There was a small stint from, from Cuba to, to California where we were in Florida for a couple of weeks visiting family. But basically my whole life, I've been a California kid. Grew up in El Monte, California. I went, uh, graduated from a Royal High School. I was a captain of my wrestling team for two years there. Uh, I went to Mount Sac College. I was a captain of my wrestling team in, in college. Right after college, I started to do jujitsu. This was in 1997, right after the UFC. I didn't want to start jujitsu while I was wrestling because I didn't want to develop any bad habits while I was a competitive wrestler. I took to jujitsu quite well. Um, the first tournament I ever did as a, as a white belt was a blue belt only tournament. My instructor, Rodrigo Maderos was like, you're, you're competing. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, am I getting a blue belt? And he's just like, no. So then I, I went and did the tournament and I beat the guy that won the Pan Ams that year as a white belt. Uh, he was a blue belt. He won the blue belt Pan Ams and I beat him as a white belt. And I won as a blue belt. I think I won 16 tournaments. And then I got my purple belt um, within a year. And then as a purple belt, I won 14 tournaments. And then I got my, my purple, my brown belt after a year and a half. So I had three years, I was a brown belt. And then I spent two and a half years as a brown belt. And then I, I received my black belt in 2003. As far as I'm, as far as I know, I'm the first Cuban-born immigrant to have a jiu-jitsu black belt in history. Wow! First Cuban-born immigrant to get their Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I find ten to twelve years old a very formative time in people's lives. If you think back to that time, and I also find growing up Italian, I'm sure Cuban, it's the same. Where the dinner table is a very important part of your upbringing. Your, your core families there gathering at night. What did the dinner table look like for you, 10 to 12 years old? Who was there? Could you describe the um, scene? You know, I had a, I have an older sister um, who's, who's basically like my second mom, who, you know, was 10 years older. So she was 22. She was married. She had my, my nephew at the, around that age. So I, I basically grew up like an only child more or less most you know most of my life that i can remember my family was very they tried to just 
make me feel safe, essentially, right? I, I, I was very sheltered as a kid. Like I said, I was a communist home, so wasn't allowed to go outside, wasn't allowed to play with other kids, wasn't allowed to to ride my bike or anything. And, it, and, and right around that time, 11, 12 years old, my mom ended up marrying an American, and he, he kind of was able to tell her, like, hey, he's a boy, he, he's 12 years old, let the kid live, essentially. So I was able to start. I was very socially awkward at that time as well. So it was quite a difference because my stepdad who was great, who's passed on since, but who was very, very good to me, you know, was an American hamburger steaks, you know, you know, basically an American uh, from Nebraska. I had a, a very kind of traditional Cuban upbringing with, you know, Cuban food and all those things. So it was a quite unique experience. It was American food, steak, meatloaf, you know, potatoes, and then, and then Cuban food, ropa vieja and, and plantains and black beans and white rice. So I didn't really think of it as anything super crazy different, but I mean, it's a pretty unique experience when you break down the two different cultures and things like that. Let's fast forward a little bit, say to 18 years old. Javier, mm -hmm. if someone asked like the 18 year old version of you, what you wanted to be when you grew up, what do you think the 18 year old version of you would have said? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. Like when I graduated high school, I was a pretty decent high school student. I, I showed up every day and did my work. I didn't consider myself you know, super smart or anything in high school. I just kind of made it through. But I did love wrestling, right? So I had no I, I had no plans when I was 18. All I knew when I was 18, I graduated from high school. I think I had like a 3.0 GPA. Nothing, nothing crazy. But, I, you know, I wasn't like terrible. And I ended up, uh, my wrestling coach is like, basically made my decision for me. He's like, you're wrestling at Mount Sac. He was one of the assistants there. So I, I went to Mount Sac, which is a junior college. And I wrestled there. And I ended up getting my associates, again, with no real plan or strategy as to what I'm going to do with my life. And, um, you know, got it like a regular job. And then I started training jujitsu right after college. So I was about 21, 22 years old. And I started training jujitsu, met a bunch of friends with jujitsu and then basically had, had like a, not a nine to five job, but basically had like a regular job stocking shelves. I worked for a grocery store and then I worked for like a, a specialty foods uh, company for a while stocking shelves and I hated it mm -hmm. and I ended up early in my career got an opportunity to fight in Japan and I basically quit my job and I just started fighting and then working at a nightclub at night bouncing but my 18 year old self was uh, I had no clue on what I was doing all I wanted to do was just wrestle and I wasn't really pressured to leave my home my mom I ended up moving out when I was like 24, 25 years old. And my mom was like, didn't want to leave, want me to leave then. I'm like, mom, I got to go. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, my mom was always very protective of me. I was the baby of the family for, you know, uh, my nephew was born when I was, when I was 12. So I was the baby of the family for a long time. But as far as like what I'm going to do with my life, I really stumbled across it. Like, like teaching jujitsu was not something that I really, planned on doing or anything of the sort I, I i just kind of followed what i liked doing which was wrestling and grappling and i had a lot of success early on in, in my jiu-jitsu and mma career and uh i just started to do that you know at the time there wasn't a whole lot of money so it was like train at night and go to work after that and wake up in the morning and just kind of do it all over again you know can you remember the first time you had exposure to brazilian jiu-jitsu the first time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was probably maybe 19 or 20 years old. I was wrestling in college. And I, there was a like a Korean or Chinese, what, what you know, video store. Like a, not Blockbuster. Blockbuster was like one of the big chains. But there was a small mom and pop like video store. And I saw um, the UFC. And I had heard about it, but I never really saw it. So I, I, the first one I saw was UFC 4 when Dan Seven ended up fighting Hoist Gracie in the finals. Yep. And of course, I wanted Dan Seven to win. I didn't even know who Hoist Gracie was at the time. So the wrestler, of course, I was cheering the wrestler to win to to win the tournament, and and, and ultimately Hoist beat him in the finals. Then I saw that they had like the first. They had UFC two, three, and four. UFC one was not out on video at the time yet. It came out years later. Um, and I said, "Wow, this is this would be great." Like, and and it's it's a wrestling was taking its tore my body my neck my lower back and stuff i was kind of always banged up because wrestling was so intense i wrestled in college i got a chance to wrestle division one I, I i probably could have gotten my bachelor's and, and gotten it paid for by by either cal state fullerton or cal state bakersfield they were both kind of recruiting me to, to go wrestle there and i just didn't want to 
I, I didn't want to cut the weight anymore. It just, I was banged up. I just didn't want to keep doing it, even though I know I would have done well. I just mentally, I just didn't want to go through a wrestling season and get in wrestling shape and do all that, cutting weight and all that. So that's when I decided to start start doing jujitsu. The second I saw it, I'm like, yeah, this is something I definitely would would like to learn because it's different. And then I ended up uh, coming to uh, my first jujitsu coach, a guy named Batiste Mansuri, he used to go into Mount Sac and wrestle, and he watched me wrestle, and we got to talking. And he was a purple belt at the time, which was at the time that there were no purple belts at the time. Yep. So I got a chance to roll with him, and I'm like, "Let can we do jujitsu?" He's like, "Yeah." So I took him down, armbar. Took him down, triangle. Took him down, armbar. So I was like, "Wow, this is so." so different and i kind of became um i was a fanatic right like there's there's a few of us at the time um that became fanatics and and got promoted very quickly i definitely was a fanatic at the time bj penn was another fanatic at the time that's why he got promoted so quickly we just we just become obsessed with it Mm -hmm. my objective with jujitsu initially was to learn how to fight right like people didn't really recognize wrestling as an art of fighting but it really is like and I kind of always knew that. I'm like, if I get into a fight, I'm just going to dump this guy. And I said that that was never really a, a, a problem for me. Mm-hmm. My goal was like, yeah, I want to be good at fighting so I don't get hit. That was always my, my from the very beginning, don't get hit. That's what I had, has on my academy when you walk in, don't get hit. Rule one is don't get hit. Mm-hmm. And I really believe that not getting hit in a fight keeps you, keeps the fear down in the fight. You don't get anxious you don't you don't have fear because you're not taking damage if you're really good at not taking damage then what is the fear in a fight people are afraid of getting hit and taking damage but the second you say okay well i'm not getting hit i know i'm not going to get hit i have confidence i'm not going to get hit it takes a, the fear out of fighting what is the fear if you're not getting hit so i watched hoist you know defend strikes from dan severin and end up on his back and defend strikes and i started to slow down what he was doing and i'm like yeah so so even from a very early age, even though I won a lot of tournaments, I ended up winning like four, over 40 tournaments in my career. Even, even though I was winning tournaments, I never lost sight of what the point of, of the exercise was, which was to learn how not to get hit and to learn how to, how to fight in a real fight in case something happened and be able to defend myself. That was always my primary goal. And, and that's my goal as an instructor now is to teach my students how, how to fight. There are ways that you can fight where you don't take damage. There are behaviors that you can implement and behave in particular ways, which will lead you to not taking damage. And that's kind of my primary goal as an instructor now is to pass on the knowledge that I've gained through my 30 years of experience and, and my 20, ultimately I had like 25 total fights in my career. And if you look at my fights, I don't take damage. I never took damage. There was one fight that, that I was a little bit overconfident and I took more damage than I should have. But had I really followed my, my game plan that I followed in every one of my fights, I wouldn't have gotten hit there as well. But the goal is simple. If you want to learn sport jiu-jitsu, even though my jiu-jitsu is, I think, phenomenal for sport, that's not, what I'm, that's not my primary focus. My primary focus is, is to teach people how to defend themselves and, and to teach people how not to take damage. Thank you for sharing that. One of the things I found doing some research is on it's BJJ Fanatics, your ground and pound system and your principles. Mm-hmm. Let's speak about the four principles I took out of that. And the first one, inside control is key. Can you speak mm-hmm. to why that's so important? Well, I think that, and my students are starting to real, really realize it. Like they watch UFC fights and they see people taking damage and, and, and I harp on inside control so much. And the reason is, is that if, if somebody's hands are inside of your hands, they have access to hitting you in the head. But if your hands are inside of theirs, everything is always going to be deflecting away from your head. So, of course, then the question becomes, how do I get my hands to the inside? And there's a variety of swims that I use that will allow me to be on the inside. And I, and I have what I call relentless persistence when I don't allow you to be on the inside no matter what. I know that if I pause when your hands are on the inside, I'm gonna get hit. So what it does also, it allows you to develop a defensive perimeter psychologically, physically and psychologically, which allows you to be a little bit calmer knowing whenever you're on the inside, you're not gonna take damage. I believe that a lot of people have a natural anxiety because they don't know when they're going to get hit. They, they don't know when they're exposed or not. Mm-hmm. It's a key indicator which allows you to know 
if you're going to get hit or the probability of you getting hit or not. So if you're always fighting to be on the inside, and that is the battle. The battle is not for me to block your punches. My battle is to be on the inside. I know you will not land the punch if I am on the inside. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes master getting on the inside. So there's a variety of swims around the world, uh, basic swim, clamp and block. Um, grab PO transfers, a bunch of independent swims that I cover in that series, which are my primary defensive mechanisms, which build a defensive perimeter so that I can be a little bit calmer and my anxiety is less. And ultimately, this gives you um, what I call your mental condition, right? So the fact that I'm not nervous at all allows me to be calm. And that calmness ultimately allows me to gain conditioning. Yeah, that when you're inside, like in the closed guard, like if they're inside, even though you have them in the closed guard, their hands are in the side. You're so exposed. Like it's just like the sirens are going off when you, when someone, but when you go, you swim inside and maybe grab that head control and that elbows on the outside, it just feels so different, right? Like the anxieties. It's more than that. Inside control is a premise, right? It, it, it is something that's important, but also shifting angle makes it easier. Also being able to to use your knees as shields, also filling space, base disruption. There's a there's a set of rules that I follow and that I've implemented my entire career, which which ultimately ultimately it leads to discouraging the opponent trying to hit me within the guard. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what I'm doing is I'm generating a behavior. I call this generating behavior. My entire career, everybody I've trained with, they're not super happy being inside my guard because they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So ultimately what happens is people start to back out of my guard, which is wonderful because now I'm no longer going to be on my back. Now I can push them away and stand up to my feet and possibly end up on top of them. So I, I create such a, a dead end when I get put on my back from side mount, from half guard, from guard. It doesn't matter mount, doesn't matter where I am. It always leads to a dead end as it pertains to people hitting me. Mm -hmm. So if people can't go forward, they got to go back. So when they go back, that leaves opportunity for, for, the, for me to get up, to get out, to, to create space, to sweep, to attack submissions, things of that nature. My, my goal, like if you look at jujitsu people in general, what do they tell you? Sweep and submit when you're on your back. That's the mindset, right? It's a mental shift, right? Sweep and submit. That's not my mindset at all when I'm on my back. My mind is very simple. Neutralize strikes, sweep and submit. And if you do things in that order where you're neutralizing strikes first, everything changes. Everything shifts. Now, most instructors and most practitioners don't roll with strikes because they don't like to. They don't like the feeling. That it's too hard. It's too tiring. Whatever. That's all I do. That's all, I mean, we roll with strikes here as well. But, but in, in the back of our mind, we know that the reason I tell you to control the hands, the reason I tell you to fill the space, the reason I tell you to be on the inside is ultimately if the opponent does decide to throw strikes, we don't have to change our game. I don't have to change my jujitsu for MMA at all. Mm -hmm. The jujitsu I practice every day is the same. My hand control is the same and it works universally. So instead of having to learn two styles of jujitsu for two different applications, I teach one style one application and it's universally applicable. Wow. Uh, the second principle I picked up from the, the tour, tutorial, be sticky, maintain contact with your opponent. You're always- uh, 100%. Can you, can you speak to 100%. that? 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, I taught a seminar several years back in Canada and I've done this experiment here with my guys. So I, I knew that it, it would work. And the experiment was simple. I, I told the guys, all the guy on top has to do is touch the face. All the all they have to do on the bottom is don't get your face touched. That was it. It was a very simple exercise. And at the beginning of the exercise, the beginning of the seminar, people were getting slapped around and you know, getting touched up. By the end of the seminar, it was it was a complete transformation because now you understand the key principles. Now, I can defend strikes. Eyes open, eyes closed, doesn't matter. And the reason I can defend strikes, eyes open or eyes closed is because I'm not looking for the punches. I am feeling where your hands are at. So if you lose contact with the hands, now you don't know where the hands are at. You can find the shoulders and slide yourself towards the hands. So I'm always understand where your hands are at. Mm -hmm. And the ability to be sticky, 
the ability to stay on the inside, the ability to hold on to things and the ability to be sticky are skills that are not really discussed. I know that the second I touch you, it's like those little, remember those little rubber hands that, that, that were stretchy that you yeah. wet and they throw it and tack, it would stick. That's kind of the idea. There's a concept I call absorption, which I discuss in JVOS, which is the ability to stay stuck to something. If a, a lot of people have the misconception of holding on to things is just sheer strength. The grip itself is an element or the, the stickiness is an element of the strength of the grip. But if, if my grip strength is 10 and you're pulling at 11, it's going to create what I call slippage, which I also discuss in JVOS. So if I can only hold you at 10 and you're pulling at 11, it, it limits what I can do. But if I absorb, so if you pull, if I go with you, it adds an extra element of stickiness to the control. So it's not just the grip. A lot of people think that, that control is just holding and, and overwhelming. Control is the ability to absorb opponent, an opponent's escape attempt, a, an opponent's pull attempt. So it's not like you're just simply grabbing and holding forever. Yes, there is an element of that, but there's also an element of the absorption element. And then there's the element of when the person disconnects for you to be able to re-swim to the inside. So as the punch comes back for you to be able to regain control. Control has layers of detail or layers of awareness or layers of consciousness that I discuss that go far beyond the simple strength element. Yes, of course, strength is a factor, but it's not the only factor. It's the ability to stay sticky. It's the ability to regain inside control. It's the ability to absorb. All of these things contribute to control and, conti and contribute to the stickiness, the ability to hold on to things, whether it's feet, hands, elbows, head, it's all the same. The third element I picked up, you speak a lot about filling space. Could you speak to the importance of filling space? Yeah. A lot of times what happens is the opponent, say, for example, we're in the guard and their head is down and the opponent is able to posture up. Now, there's 90 degrees of space here. Like when the person is close, you're not going to take damage. If the person is far away, you're not going to take damage. It's the middle zone that you're always going to take damage. So yeah. if the opponent is able to come in and out whenever they want, um, you're more likely to, to, to take damage because they are able to generate speed and power within this 90 degree range, right? Mm -hmm. But if you fill the space and control the distance, whether it be with your knees or, or with your shins or with your knees or your shins primarily, and then eventually your hands come in and your forearms and hands come in. But if you're able to manage that distance and fill that gap, the opponent does not have the, 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 the required space that they need to generate speed and power. So now all of a sudden everything is kind of bogged down. So now they're having to kind of bust through your control. And again, that kind of dissipates the speed and power, which even if the person lands a shot, it's not going to do any substantial damage, which I'm not saying I never get touched. I, I rarely get touched. Let's just say that. But even if I do get hit, it's going through so many barriers of, of defense that by the time the shot lands, it's not there's nothing to it. So there's no fear. And the fourth principle I picked up out of the ground and pound system, how about base disruption? That's just so killer. Yes. Base disruption is something that's not really discussed, right? People throw a punch and people just want to block the punch, but there's ways to disrupt the base as the opponent is punching, whether with your feet or your shins. So when the person punches, they expect the punch to land at a certain distance, but if you disrupt their base, they're always going to end up short. So there's no fear of me getting hit because you're never going to reach me. So again, this creates a level of calm, which allows you to gain conditioning and, and keep your mind in a very present state, which is not burning energy. And it ultimately, it allows you to make better decisions. Yeah, base disruption is something that I've never heard of anybody else. These are concepts. Filling space is a concept that I've heard before. Base disruption is not. Inside control is king is something that, that I've really preached on. I don't know how many other people preach on that. But yeah, some of these are definitely unique to me. I've never heard, I wasn't taught them. But these are just things that I've developed and learned over time and just hours and hours of research and development trying to figure out what works best. And then speaking of the, of the UFC, your professional fighting career. So you, I see maybe 16 and five with 11 subs. Is that fair? That record? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. You develop your system like in the ring, combat, how do you know like you have such a high level of success 
fast forward through that. You speak a lot about mindset and your training. How do you know it's time to stop? I know you've still had a lot left. Like what made you walk <laughs> away? Like to how stop you, fighting? Yeah. Like how did you know when to stop <laughs> fighting? Like what's the key? You had, you, had, you had over 20 fights and a high level of success. How do you know when to walk away from that like you did? Walk us through that process. That's an interesting question that you asked that because I should I should have the second run of my career I should have never did it right like if you if if you talk to any one of my doctors after my at the time I had had three knee surgeries and I had three after so I had six knee surgeries on my injured leg I should have never been able to continue to fight but I had prior to my injuries. I was already being recruited by the UFC. You know, when the UFC was doing three shows a year, the UFC wanted me in, in, to fight there. And it was a lifelong goal to do it. So for me, it was like the goal was always to get to the UFC. I think it gives a certain level of credibility to fight in the UFC. Mm-hmm. And it gives even more credibility if you can win in the UFC. So it was very important for me to, to not just fight in the UFC, but to actually get a win in the UFC, which I was able to do both. And professionally, you know, there was a time in my career where I honestly don't, I honestly think that nobody could beat me. I think I had two thirds of the skill sets required during a time where people were still trying to figure out, you know, one or two skills. I had high level wrestling and I had high level jujitsu and my striking, I kept hidden. I had good striking, very good striking, but I had no, I felt no need to show it because then the people start breaking down your film and, mm-hmm. and then you, you, there's more problems you're, you're creating more problems the more you show. So I kept my stand up hidden until I needed to use it. So I, I had to fight in the UFC for my own, conscious i i I live my life in a way where i I want no regrets right and um walking away was very hard for me because i felt i could still even with all my injuries i still felt that i could be a top contender but i got tired of the lifestyle i got tired of the injuries i got tired of always being banged up i got tired of of the mental grind um i got tired of I got tired of the lifestyle and I started really understanding what lifestyle was. You know, I could still teach jujitsu. I could still train. I could still do, train people. I can still do all the same things, but not have that mental focus where at the time, you know, if I wanted to drink, which I don't drink anymore, but at the time, if I wanted to drink or, or vacation or, or whatever, like I can do it. Whereas if you're in fight camp and stuff, I was very disciplined. And I would do those things mm-hmm. ever. I wouldn't cheat on my diet. I wouldn't drink. I wouldn't do anything I wasn't supposed to. I was pretty disciplined in that sense. So that mental grind was just something I got tired of, the physical and mental grind. And it just got to a point where I was comfortable enough with myself where I can walk away and said, what more do I need to prove? I have a great record. If you look at all of my losses, four of the five losses could have easily gone to me and they should have gone to me. Now I'm 20 and one. So I was okay with that. I understand that judges sometimes don't make the the best decision. I felt that I had gathered and gained enough credibility to, I didn't need to do it anymore. If you have a, if you, and I was always the kind of person where if you thought that you can beat me, I'm more, people didn't call me out because I was more than happy to say, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was okay with that. And it got to a point where how much is enough? You know, it was hard on my family. It was hard on my kids. So I'm like, and, I, and I'm like, there's no more that I need to prove to myself. It was, it was me proving to myself more than anything. I, I didn't really care what other people thought. It was more me proving to myself, you know, I was happy enough with, that, with what I achieved to be able to walk away uh, content. And is there a better feeling in the world than being content? Like you said, you proved it to yourself. You had the mindset. You just had that feeling that you accomplished it. There was nothing left to prove. Now, nah, kudos. That is awesome. One little highlight. The squeeze wasn't worth the juice anymore. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't worth it, right? And you knew that. 
How many people well, the squeeze around? wasn't worth the juice? How many people wait three, four, five fights too long? You know what I mean? And they have that one hellacious, they get crushed five fights later than they should be, and they then they get brain damage or whatever it is. It's 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 amazing. That was another thing, another reason why I, I was so big on not taking damage is because I wanted to be able to not have brain damage, right? So that I preserved myself in that way. Yeah, I, I, my body took a lot of damage. My knee and my body took a lot of damage. But I wasn't get, I never got knocked out. I never got knocked out in practice. I never got submitted in a fight. I mean, those are pretty good, pretty good credentials to where I had 25 fights in, in total, but never got tapped, never got submitted. Or excuse me, never got never got submitted, never got knocked out. That's crazy. That in is 20 in 21 so pro fights. Like who else can say that? That's crazy. Not too many people. Uh, here, right. here's, some, here's something I don't think too many other people could say. I know I couldn't say this. Uh, December 2009, Sports Illustrated said this is the yeah. most inspirational performance of the decade in MMA for your fight against Alberto Crane, where you fought not one, not two, but three yeah. rounds with a torn ACL. Walk us through that. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, I tore one. Yeah, that was. That's, I, I could just speak for. I tore mine in training and I couldn't even walk down the steps. So I, I can't even imagine <laughs> fighting three rounds. So tell, tell us about that. You know, I was, I was very confident going into that fight. That was one fight that I was going to try to use my stand up. That was the whole game plan. He was, a, he was a, the second world champion, second American world champion after BJ Penn, high level jujitsu guy. I'm like, eh, why do I? And I was a brown belt at the time. I'm like, I wasn't afraid of his jujitsu, but why am I going to fight him at his strength? So I, most of the camp was me working on stand-up. And the first punch I threw, I slipped on the mat and, and my knee got blown out. And, and uh, people asked me, why did I keep fighting? Why did I do it? And, and to be honest with you, I had a UFC contract sitting on my, in my printer. I just had to sign it and send it back. So um, at the time, there wasn't very many opportunities like that. And I had to win. And I honestly felt I, I did win. Some people disagree with me, but if you go back and look at the rounds and, and you score the fight, I thought I won the fight. I thought I won two of the three rounds, but it didn't happen. But I got a lot of love for that fight. Obviously, I got a lot of accolades for a loss, which I thought was pretty wild, especially when losses were such a big deal at the time. If you're going to lose to get the kind of accolades I, I, I got was pretty, pretty intense. But, uh, Losing wasn't an option. People were like, why did you keep fighting? I'm like, dude, I, I couldn't even think about quitting. It wasn't an option. I'm like, I can I can win this fight. I just kept thinking I can win this fight. I can win this fight. So um, it was what it was, man. I, you know, I always prided myself in giving everything I had and everything I ever did. Mm -hmm. And that fight was no different. I didn't see that any different of anything else I've ever done. But the impact it had on, on so many people and so many people bring it up and so many people talk to me about it. It was, it's pretty surreal. You know, I was just being me. I was just fighting. But it, when I got back to the locker room and, and this is when the internet first started, right? And my friend, John Jensen, his wife was at home watching and people were just like unbelievable. And all my friends were reaching out and overwhelming support and love and pride in, in what I did. And it was a really cool experience, especially, you know, being injured and, and, and losing the opportunity to fight in the UFC. I was so depressed and bummed out about that, that the positivity from so many people definitely carried me through that. It was a very interesting experience, very cool experience. For the listeners who maybe never blew out their ACL before, could you tell what that feels like? Did you hear the pop? Did you feel the pop when it happened? I felt the pop, but it was the instability. Yeah, it's Like crazy. every time I would plant a throw, it would just, I would just fall. Mm -hmm. It was, it was bizarre, you know, and you're used to like, oh, this, this shouldn't be happening. And every time I would plant to throw, I would just fall. So, um, you know, it was, it was a challenge. It was a, I felt I was fighting my knee and an opponent in there and the crowd, the crowd was, it was the rowdiest crowd I'd ever fought in front of. And I fought in Japan, like against their hometown boy. And it was nothing compared to, to New Mexico with, with Alberto Crane. It was a wild night. It was wild. Wow, that is awesome. Another thing, just looking at your history, maybe eight years later, roughly, 2017, diagnosed with <laughs> colon cancer. <laughs> yeah. um, would you mind talking about just what you went through there and how you beat colon cancer? 
Would you mind telling <laughs> the story? Man, let me tell you. 2017 was a pretty catastrophic year. Cancer was cancer was one of eight life changing situations that happened in one year. Any one of the eight things that happened to me in 2017, most people would have quit. From what I'm, it, it was like a tsunami. It was, it was moving out on my own, basically filing for a divorce, getting diagnosed with cancer, losing my academy, having a resection surgery, which is a major recovery, um, healing from the cancer without chemo, natural and a holistic approach that I use with the Gerson therapy, opening up an academy, another academy, and getting promoted. All in one year, all wow. within 12 months. All of that happened within 12 months. My mom tells me, I don't know how you made it. Like, seriously, I don't know how you did it. But wow. it was just, I've done some hard things in my life. That was a rough year. And um, the Gerson therapy that I used to beat the cancer was very, very difficult. It, it was no joke. It was 12 juices. I was pressing 12 juices a day. Okay. No salt, no oil, all organic food coffee treatments, which, which was for detox supplementation. It was like, it's like this whole protocol that, that I went through when I got diagnosed, I had the resection surgery. I came back from surgery. My doctor's like, you got to do chemo. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not going to do chemo. And he looked at me and he said, you're committing suicide. I looked at him laughed in his face and I said, we'll see. And then he was like pissed. And then I, I, I started the therapy. And after three months, it was gone. Everything was gone. Not, nothing was detectable after three months. And so on the fourth month, I went back for my checkup for, with my oncologist. And I threw the paperwork on his desk. And he looks at me and he's like, how did you do this? I told him, I said, maybe I know something that you don't. Because I told you. Remember I told you that? He was pissed. Because doctors don't like to be shown up. I wasn't trying to show him up. But I knew something that he didn't. Maybe I knew something that he didn't. Because when I was... In my early 30s and my body started to change and, and my career, like I started to realize I couldn't do what I was doing when I was younger. I started looking into nutrition and I started looking into diet and I came across this lady. Her name was Charlotte Gerson and she was pushing like, yeah, we cure cancer all the time. I was like, what do you mean cure cancer? I'm like, There's a cure for cancer. So in the back of my mind, I knew that there was a cure for cancer. I never thought I was going to need it, but ultimately, um, I used it. When you think about it, it makes complete sense. People don't realize. People are always looking for something from the outside to cure them, taking ingesting things that are going to cure them. People don't realize that healing comes from the inside out. It's the mindset that I had to heal. It's the nutrition that I had to heal. It's the worth, work ethic that I had to heal. It was dedicating my life to healing. And I healed in three months. And people, people don't understand people. I've had so many people I've, I've had like at this point, lots of people reach out. How did you do it? My family got, my mom got diagnosed. My uncle got diagnosed, you know, whatever. And, and I talk to everybody who, 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 who reaches out. I definitely sit down and I talk to them um, about it. And, and sometimes it's doable and, and sometimes it's not. If it's like stage four, it's, it's tough because when, when you're fighting cancer, you have to understand what cancer is. And cancer is a dis-ease in your body. Sometimes it's caused by emotion, which I didn't know, which is how I got it. I was a world-class athlete. I wasn't a big meat eater at the time. I was mostly vegan. And my doctor's like, you have a family history? No. Like, you meat eater? No. They're like, are you stressed? And I'm like, stress is through the roof, right? So I didn't understand how stress affects the body, how your thoughts can make you sick. That is, That was like a real pivotal paradigm shift. Your thoughts can make you sick. Your thoughts can heal you. So the second you start to understand that regulating your emotions, as well as the nutrition, as well as you know, I threw everything at it. I threw sound healing. I threw the therapy. I threw meditation. I threw breath work. I threw everything I could, complete lifestyle change. 
I threw everything I could, and that's how you heal. When you commit yourself to healing, I think a lot of people go down the mindset, right? A lot of people go down the route of, um, and it happened to me. I had two occasions when it happened, and I instantly recognized it, and I instantly shifted my thoughts. I had two occasions where, what if I die? I'm going to die. You know, you start kind of going down this rabbit hole, and, and your thoughts can spiral out of control, and it shifts your mood, and it shifts your thinking pattern, and it ultimately will shift your physical being. And the second I thought to myself that I'm going to die or whatever, I instantly caught those thoughts and, and immediately turned them off because those are the thoughts that will lead to the results, right? So the second that and it, those thoughts help you make you make decisions that don't benefit you. Whereas if you stay positive and you stay in a mindset of you're going to heal, it's a matter of time. That's the, that's the way I thought about it. If I'm on this therapy long enough, it's a matter of time. It's proven to work. It will work. It, it's going to happen. You know, I always stay positive like that. There was two instances early on where, where I thought I wasn't going to make it. And my mind was strong enough to pull myself out of those thoughts and, and to be able to, to shift to the positive and, and understand that it was going to happen and it did happen. Right. So I think your mind is such a powerful tool and I never really understood what that meant, but now beating the cancer and creating JVOS and understanding how mental shifts can dramatically change your jujitsu, they can dramatically change your life and opening your mind to new ideas can really change who you are as a human being. Wow. First off, thank you for sharing that. Just to recap real quick, 2017, you said you got divorced. You were diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. You lost your academy. You had a resection surgery. The doctor said that you needed to start chemo. And then you said, no, we're going to do Gerson therapy, which is basically about removing the toxins or something to do with toxic, removing toxins from the body. Yes. So Gerson therapy is a protocol, which is based on four principles. The first principle is juicing, right? So you're, you're, you're taking organic juices prepared in a particular way with using a particular kind of machine, okay. which is a two-step grind and press juicer. I use the Norwalk, but the best one out right now is called a pure juicer. They're not cheap, but they will revitalize your health. So you're taking in highly dense nutritional food, right? So you're, the, the food that I take in is highly dense nutritionally. Secondly, you're taking in supplements, which are kind of filling in the gaps of what you're not getting from juices. The, the supplement protocol is based on your blood work. So whatever you're missing, they, they kind of supplement you accordingly. The third part is basically for what's called soft bulk, which is kind of helps the, you can't just do juices, right? There needs to be some sort of fiber, which pushes the things through your digestive tract, which is basically just vegetables. It's, it's no oil, no salt, no very, very minimal seasoning. No processed food, basically just vegetables, potatoes, vegetables, broccoli, whatever, prepared in a variety of different ways. There's an organic hockey soup that, that we take in as well. That's all part of the soft bulk. And then the fourth part is a detoxification using coffee enemas. And people go, oh, my God, coffee enemas. But when you really look at it as a system, so if you look at a chart of the human body, head, body, right, in with the good, out with the bad. And when you start doing this process, in with the good nutrition, out with the bad, in with the good, pulling out toxins, in with the good, uh, doing castor oil treatments, in with the good. And this process, you're, you're filtering out and you're detoxifying your body. Your body naturally rejuvenates the cells that are being rebuilt. You're pulling the toxins out at a cellular level and then you're getting rid of them through the coffee enemas, which are pulling the stuff out. Your body basically rebuilds itself from the inside out with the nutrition. That's why it takes time. That's why when you're running stage four, do you have the time in order for the process to happen? So stage three, I was on the, on the brink, right? Like stage three, I barely, you know, essentially barely made it, right? Um, because it was so far along. But when you rejuvenate your body at a cellular level and you rebuild your body at a cellular level, of course, it's going to you're going to heal and you're going to get rid of that toxic material within your cells and within your lymph nodes. It is possible. It's a four-step process. It's the juicing, the supplementation, the food, and then the, the detoxification. That is incredible. Thank, thank you for walking us through that. 
you mentioned a few moments ago about principles and how your new your JVOS system is based on switching over to that. Uh, the slogan you mentioned a few times in your online material, change jujitsu forever. Can you speak about 100%. JVOS and what you're doing and what, what it's all about? J- JVOS is a mind mindset. It's a shift in mindset. I don't teach moves anymore. JVOS is the core of what project I'm currently putting together, which is a master plan, which is going to be the greatest curriculum ever created for any martial art in history. Mark my words. What the master plan is, is going to change everything for everybody. The the core of the master plan is the mindset. It's how I think about each individual position or what I call a positional perspective. There are 18 positional perspectives starting in standing. Standing is broken up into four sections, two sections, striking and takedowns. Chapters one and two are striking offense and defense. Chapters three and four are, are takedowns, offense and defense. Five and six are turtle top and bottom. Seven and eight, back mount offense and defense. Uh, so on and so forth. Side mount, top and bottom, guard, top and bottom, mount, top and bottom, AFC, top and bottom offense, defense, and then leg locks, offense and defense. And these positions are the starting point of each perspective. So if you're in side mount bottom, that is a perspective. Each perspective has what I call a central path, which is a primary attack or defensive strategy. The, primary, the, the, the central path is doing what works best first. If you are attacking or defending with what works best first, the opponent will start to behave in a particular way. I am the one that's generating their behavior based on a timeline of events. Now, who is controlling the timeline of events? I am. They are based on primary, secondary, and supplemental options based off of my behavior, which I'm generating your behavior. So what I'm doing is, is essentially, I'm making you do what I want. Now, if you don't defend the central path the way I am suggesting you to do, the central path works. You have to defend the central path in a particular way. Now, what is the base of everything I'm doing? It is based on the first group of JVOS, which I call keys to the kingdom. Hand control is king. If I control your hands from each perspective, I'm going to win. Very simple. The simplicity in the system and the open-mindedness of the concepts, JVOS has 56 concepts. Each concept allows you to view jujitsu and view each perspective through a particular lens. It's no longer about moves because the moves ultimately lead to an end result. Mm -hmm. Controlling the hand will will automatically make you more difficult to deal with. It makes things work. Mm -hmm. It is the core of most problems. The vast majority of problems are based on the lack of control of an opponent's hands. And something else I'm calling configuration theory. Configuration theory states that there are certain configuration bodies, like our bodies can be configured in certain ways. Sometimes with something is a configurational shift, moving one arm from one side of the head to the other, which will completely shift the um, momentum in a particular position. So when you simplify things through configurations and you have a central thinking pattern and a central thinking philosophy, and then you have positional perspectives within each position based on not getting hit, high levels of effectiveness, high levels of fatigue generation. I can I can work at a lower rate than you are going to work, mm-hmm. which generates fatigue. That fatigue generation will lead to psychological breaks. So I am fighting you from a psychological perspective, from a technical perspective, from an, uh, a configurational perspective, I'm fighting you on such a different level. And if you don't know what those key configurations are, and you don't know what the crucial battles are, I'm going to win at least 80, 90% of the time. So the success rate in what I'm doing is very high. And I have a desired result in this curriculum, the way I run my academy, the way I run the machine. About every three months, new student comes in. You talk about new students. Mm-hmm. Every three to four months, 
we go through an entire cycle of this curriculum. You will see huge gains in what I call RSD, rapid skill development. You'll see huge gains in rapid skill development where, yeah, everybody else is getting better, but you are also getting better. And after three months, you are so much better than what you were three months prior that it's undeniable. It's undeniable. And, I, and I've experimented with the time frame. It's about every three, three and a half months. I see it in the way the students are behaving. I see it in the way the students success rate. And they are, I'm getting confirmation from the students. They're saying, it's crazy when they go to open mouth to, to other gyms. They're like, they don't know. I'm like, of course they don't know. What I told them, what I do is different. I don't teach you moves. I teach you the root of the problem. And when you understand the root of the problem and you understand how to beat that, there are no more problems anymore. And the root of the vast majority of problems in grappling, combat, jujitsu, fighting in general, what is the root? Do you, want, do you know what the root of the vast majority, 95% of all the problems, what is the root of the problem? Roots of the problem. The roots of the, the root problem. of the problem in fighting, the root of the problem in jujitsu, the root of the problem in wrestling, the root of the problem in fighting. What is the root of the problem? I think there's just so many options. You don't know what to do next. Like there's just so many variables coming at you. For for you, there's yeah. so many options because that's how you're taught. You're taught from the outside in. I teach yeah. from the inside out. I teach from the root of the problem. What is the root of most problems? You, know, you got me. I don't know. You control the hands. You control the fight. End of story. Why do you think I don't get hit? Control the hands. Why do you think I don't get submitted? Control the hands. Why do you think I pass the guard? Why do you think I attack the back? Every system is based on mastering hand control from every perspective. If you don't know that, you're fighting for moves, I'm fighting for your hands. Mm -hmm. When you understand basic mechanics, when you have a universal mindset, when you understand what the start of each problem is, which is the, the start of each positional perspective, I have simplified the teaching process of jujitsu and combat mm -hmm. based on 30 years of experience and success at the highest level. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change jujitsu forever. The impact that I've already had when I had a black belt, a JVOS black belt seminar to discuss the five key principles of the system. And they were like blown away. They're like, unbelievable. The way you present the material has completely changed my game. I just had a friend of mine call me yesterday. I was on a bike ride yesterday and called me. I'm like, call me when you're done with the whole program. He calls me, he goes, bro, I've been doing jujitsu for 25 years. This is the best instructional I've ever seen, ever. The way you explain it has changed my jujitsu forever. Mom. That's the goal, to change jujitsu forever. It's going to happen. It, it's happening. It's already happening. I know how good JVOS is. I know how good it is. And now it's, it's, it's slowly but surely trickling out and it's, it's going to change everything. It's unbelievable. And, and, then and, the, and let me say this. Let me be very clear on something. Sure. Before I had cancer, I was an atheist, 100% materialist, atheist. This did not come from me. This came from God, 100%. I started filming the original, I started filming, the systems haven't changed much, but the key principles have. And I started filming JVOS, or excuse me, I started filming the master plan. When COVID hit, I started filming. It gave me an opportunity to start filming. Since 2011, I had to, it took me four years. I wrote 16 books, which is, which is those books over there, like you could see them. You could see those white yeah, folders yeah. over there. Absolutely. Those are the first 16 books that I wrote. Uh, 16 books, 2,500 pages, 500,000 words, something ridiculous. It was lesson by lesson how I was teaching the system. That kind of gave me my base to where, what I was currently doing. So I ended up getting saved. I ended up you know, beating the cancer, opening the new academy, doing all these things. And then I started filming. And then little by little, these concepts started popping into my mind tension, connection, like all of the all inside control, like all of these things. So I started paying attention. I started, it became too many and I started writing them down. Then I started writing them down. I flow charted them out. 
And I go, well, this one goes with this one, this one goes with this one, this one goes with this one, this one goes with this one. And I started grouping everything. And then I'm like, well, these go together. That group is called this. These go together. This group is called this. So I started to simplify the whole process. And I got, I'm going to be releasing on my YouTube channel. I'm going to launch my YouTube channel probably within the next month or two. I'm getting a, a backlog of content so I can start releasing things mm-hmm. fairly quickly. And when that does happen, I'm basically going to explain everything, my journey in jujitsu, how I learned jujitsu, and how I'm doing it differently now. It's all flow charted out. It's all very cool presentations that, that kind of simplify what this massive project is. And ultimately, as these terms kept coming over and over and over, that's what became this. I'm like, let me film everything. Let me put everything together. And JVOS has been done about a year. But I wanted, again, I, I wanted to, I'm like, well, what is it? And it's taken me about another year, year and a half to really be able to express and explain what it is. And it's essentially just a mindset. It, it's a paradigm shift in looking at jujitsu through a different lens. Forget about moves. You can't remember steps, too many moves. It's too overwhelming. You are, you are looking at it from the leaves. I look at it from the trunk. And mm-hmm. I teach from the trunk out knowing what is truly important, not from the leaves in, because then it becomes too overwhelming. I remember when I, when I first started doing it, it's too overwhelming. It's too much, oh. too big. But when I had the, the black belt seminar and I went through the presentations, they're like, it's so much information. People were black belts were like completely like, Oh my God, this is so wild. Goes, but the way you put it together made it make sense. I go, mm-hmm. good. I mean, it took me a year and a half to actually put the, be able to express it in a way where it made sense to people. I'm super proud of the work. This right here was not for me. This was 100% from God. This was not for me at all. Yes, there were some things that I did and, and I knew before, but it's an expression of language. It's an expression of feeling from a philosophical standpoint, from a strategical standpoint. I talk about breath work, I talk about presence, I talk about consciousness, I talk about awareness, I talk about connection, disconnection. Uh, connection is, is not one term. Connection is an overall term. But what makes absorption is connection, right? Tension is connection. Tension is what you're actually feeling. And through this tension, you gain information. I discuss all these things in, in JVOS. It's a lot. It's, JVOS is like seven hours. It's seven hours of content. I tell people, take your time with it. Apply the concepts one by one. You can go through JVOS over two, three, four months. Just absorb it. It, It's a very deep and psychological and philosophical way of thinking. But once you start to apply it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. And the OS, is that operating system? What does the OS stand for? Yes, because I'm trying to... It's an operating system because I am changing your default behavior. A fresh, clean operating install. I'm, I'm installing this in your mind to give you a base to build from. And from there, you can build the software on top of it. Yes, that's why cool. it's an operating system because I'm, 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 this is for the mind. This is not for the body. This is a new yeah. way of thinking of jujitsu. That's why I say think different. Your background was with the Cross and Gracie team. You also spent a lot of time at the Gracie Academy with Henner and Hiron. Mm-hmm. Would you say the JVOS more influenced by the, your time at the Gracie Academy or the Cross and Gracie team? Where, 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 do, you see, where do you see the influences? Where, where, well, I, see? I will say this. I will say this, that the biggest difference between the Cross and Gracie team or, or BJJ and GJJ, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, is the mindset. The Cross and Gracie mindset is be aggressive, get on top, dominate, overwhelm. Alio Gracie's mindset is you can't do that. You're too small. You're too weak. Now what? What is your mindset for that? And Horian Gracie explains this perfectly. There's a, I always use this analogy. I have an island. I have a private island. And I'm going to take you on my helicopter. I'm going to drop you off on the private island. And I'm going to tell you, I'll be back tomorrow. What, what is your mindset? I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to, I guarantee I'll be back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. What's your mindset? I'm probably, I'm just going to chill out on the island and enjoy myself. Yeah. Correct. Now, same helicopter, same island. This time I say, I'm going to, I'll be back at some point. What's your mindset? 
at some point, yeah, I'm trying to find food, water, clothing. I'm trying to survive. Different mindset. The difference between Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is that. Survival mindset. Mm -hmm. Two completely different things. The difference is time. Your decisions are based differently when you put a timer on the wall. If mm -hmm. there's no timer on the wall, you make different decisions. It's a different mindset with a different outcome. The second you add time, your decisions are different. Incredible. Wrapping so up that here. was the biggest difference between the two mindsets. And yes, I have taken from each and I've tried to blend. My job, my legacy will be a blending of the two sides of the Gracie family. JBOS and, and, and the master plan will be my legacy and my biggest contributions, but really it's linking the two sides of the Gracie family is really what I've done. Two quick questions just to wrap up here. I know your time's limited. One, Javier, we spoke about so much, your JVOS system, all, all the stuff from 2017, that uh, incredible year that you gutted through, your, the mindset shift you're bringing to jujitsu. Uh, if you could have everyone listening take just one lesson away from everything we discussed, what would that lesson be? I think the biggest difference in the past several years in that I've grown from with my diet and my lifestyle, the biggest advantage is not, has, been, has not been how I feel. Yes, I feel good. I have energy. I don't really get tired. Like I'm very present. But the biggest thing is if you're able to detox from this garbage food that most people eat, and this garbage lifestyle that most people live. It's not how I feel, but it's been how I think. The nutrition and the lifestyle that I'm choosing to live in order to be here for my kids as long as I can, as long as God allows me, has been how I think. My thinking power has greatly improved and shifted, not just with JVOS, but just as a whole. My ability to focus and my ability to be present has shifted. And, and people don't really talk about that when they talk about nutrition. They talk about, oh, I feel better. Yeah, no, no. You think better. You're, you have a clarity of thought. You can recognize your toxic thoughts um, easier because your mind is more clear. So every, every choice you make, to put something in your mouth, every decision that you make with food. Be very careful and be very wise with it because it not only affects the way you feel, oh, my tummy hurts, I'm a little bit sluggish, but it also affects the way you think. And ultimately, the way you think affects your behavior and the decisions that you make in your life and even enrolling or whatever. You always want to be making decisions from a state of presence and from a state of awareness. And having the right nutrition and having the right lifestyle and having eating nutrient dense foods and avoiding toxins and detoxing from the toxins that you have ingested just from the water and the air and the basics of life, you have to detox. Your body goes in cycles. You can't just rev high forever. You have to allow your body to to go through cycles and to understand that fasting is, is necessary from time to time. And a lot of detoxification is necessary every few months because if you don't, it bogs down your system. It bogs down how you feel. And most importantly, it bogs down how you think. Thank you for sharing that. How about last question? I, that's fanta fantastic. I have a page full of notes. Javier, last question, a fun one. If you had to get a quote or a saying tattooed on your body, what would that quote or motto say? Um, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Life is a series of challenges. Your ability to endure these challenges, the reason that, that life is putting you through these challenges is for you to either quit or grow. I chose to grow. I've changed my behavior. I've changed my philosophy. I've changed my lifestyle. I've changed my thinking patterns. I've changed my beliefs. I've changed 
You're either going to change. Life is either going to blow, blow through you or you can adapt and change. And, and the more you can adapt and change and ultimately ride the wave of life, the easier life will be. If you sit there and you continue to fight life, life is going to win. So you have to be flexible and be able to be adaptable. Whether it's with your age, you can't do the things that you did when you were younger. You can't drink or party the way you did when you were younger. You have to constantly shift and adapt. Nothing is forever. You can't hold on to things forever. You're always in a state of adjustment. And that adjustment brings you what I discussed as universal comfort. You want to be able to be comfortable in life no matter what happens. You want to be emotionally stable so that if something in your life shifts or you have seven things happen to you in a year that, that or eight things happen to you in a year that are life altering that you don't break the adaptability if you watch trees in the wind they they're not rigid because if they're rigid they fall over they're able to bend and adjust and this has to be your mind and this has to be your body in life you have to be adaptable and adjustable because if you don't you will break wow that i think that is about as good as a spot as any to wrap up. Uh, Javier Vasquez, uh, I'd like to thank you, sir. It's been an honor. It's been an epic episode with you. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. If people are yeah, looking for you, oh man, it's so awesome. If people are looking for you, Javier, and what you do in JVOS online, where can we find you? At JV Jiu Jitsu on Instagram, at the real Javier Vasquez on Instagram is the easiest way to get a hold of me. You can DM me. Anybody who listens to this show, if I if you feel I've inspired you, you know, please reach out. Feel free to reach out and say something. My life is far beyond me. God has left me here for a reason. And if it's to inspire and if it's to help people change and help people shift, all the better. I'm happy to do it. I want to leave a legacy in jujitsu that my name with jujitsu will be synonymous forever. I'm hoping to do that. I'm hoping the JVOS and the master plan is going to leave me there. I know the impact it's already had on people. I know the impact that that what I'm doing is having on people. It, it, it's really been humbling, especially in the, I just never really gave myself credit or, or noticed the impact I'm having on people. But in the past several months, it's been pretty overwhelming. So I'm blessed to be here and I'm lucky to be here. And thank you so much for the opportunity. So now I'm going to put all those in the show notes and Javier, thank you for your time. It's been awesome to speak with you and wish you nothing but future success, man. Hope to stay in touch. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.